Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode five of Common Objections to a Stateless Society slash Volunteerism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, today, I am joined with Lloyd and Eric. Uh, Lloyd, you want to say a little quick something about yourself and then Eric? Uh, I'm just another voice. Uh, if I say anything that makes you go, wow, that guy's a genius, I uh, recognize that I actually know very little and I stand on the shoulders of giants, those who I've learned from before me. Cool. Eric? Um, just an anarchist that works sometimes. <laughs> Sweet. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Well, I'm uh, just trying to get random people in here that, uh, you know, it's fun to hear different opinions. If I had the same people in here every time, it would get old. So what we're doing is just having different people say this so it's not just people hearing this from one or two or three mouths. So uh, I've explained to them before the show the kind of the name of the game here and how it's going to work. But uh, the first objection we're going to get to is... This comes out of the mouth of people um, who get really confused, and it uh, doesn't make much sense to us because if you actually break down logically what they're saying, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> and it uh, basically is the assertion is, you libertarians are utopian, you anarchists are utopian, you people who don't want government are utopian. Now I'm going to give Lloyd the main speaking, uh, or main chunk on this one to maybe kind of shut this entire thing down right so of course this all depends on the words that are used uh, definitions are always vital in communicating ideas so the principal uh, word of interest here is utopian well a utopia is basically a society that has no problems Right, so this is not possible. This is an impossibility because human beings have varying interests, uh, motivations, uh, there are scarce resources, etc. So there is always going to be conflict. It is not the absence of conflict that uh, anarchists look for. It is how those conflicts are resolved. Now, what would, what would <laughs> the common uh, usage, anyway, of the word utopian is... Uh, like an idealistic and unrealistic uh, manner by which something is achieved, right? So the, I, the, so the accusation is actually that anarchists be believe in and practice or approach to, you know, human society and its organization that is impractical and unrealistic. Mm -hmm. This is, of course, uh, empirically false. And we know this simply by looking at history uh, you know when you put vast amounts of power in the hands of a very small minority it is always abused uh, as Lord Acton pointed out well over a century ago uh, you know absolute power corrupts absolutely and you know even some tendency some amount of power has a tendency to corrupt and this is because you have that imbalance in you know the relationship between the two parties so the, what's really utopian, impractical, and unrealistic is to assume that you can create a, a social organization, call it the government, invest in it massive amounts of power, authority, and weapons, and expect it to not be abused and used to control and abuse other people, essentially peaceful people, who would resolve their conflicts in any number of ways. Yeah, I always like to point out that government is like... Um there's a hundred people in a room and one guy's got a gun and no one else has a gun. You have no choice but to obey that guy with a gun unless you want to die or catch him off guard, etc. But if everyone has a gun, that one guy's gun doesn't really met matter that much anymore. Right, it's the imbalance of power in the relationships. So, you know, you, like, like your uh, guys in the, in the, in the room, uh, in that example, you have a vast imbalance of power. So the one dude with the, uh, with the gun you know, he pretty much gets to say what goes down. Whereas if all 100 men in the room have a gun, everyone's going to be a bit more polite. Uh, one of my <laughs> favorite authors, uh, Robert Heinlein, uh, was uh, once uh, stated that an armed society is a polite society. Because, you know, when everyone's on an even playing field, you kind of got to give each other basic courtesy. 
and that's really where good dispute resolution starts. Very true. I mean, the, the, the facts are on the wall. I mean, Chicago Police Department just released a statement saying that since the concealed carry, uh, the more concealed carries they issue, the less crime happens. So I just think that's absolutely hilarious. One of the most res gun restricted cities that has had some of the highest homicide rates. But that's not really the point of the question. I mean, we could go on gun control for hours. But uh, Eric, anything you want to say about um, you, you libertarians, or utopian? Uh, yeah. So going along with uh, his point about, uh, I guess people believe that uh, government is uh, the best we have <clears throat> and that uh, there can be nothing greater uh, the government is for the good of all <laughs> um, and to me that also sounds very utopian uh, <clears throat> I, I find that <sighs> it's more utopian to believe that government is capable of doing better than individuals can do for themselves. Um, when you have, and, and as far as, uh, as centralized power uh, for a small group of people, I think it's also just as dangerous for a group of millions of people to have enough power that they can uh, say, you know, uh, invade a country, uh, kill a bunch of people with impunity, and there is no accountability for it because the the, the common voter uh, has is behind it, and so you don't have a person that is actually accountable for any crimes that the government commits um, in a uh, society where uh, the accountability rests upon the individual. You don't have to worry about him. Uh, invading a nation of people um, because he has to have uh, a certain amount of power uh, that requires a lot of people, a lot of money, a lot of resources. So I would say that it is less utopian to believe in uh, individual accountability than a, a government accountability. Yeah, I... I... I always, whenever I get called utopian, I always say <clears throat> it's more utopian to believe that government can reduce risk in life uh, than um, realizing that there is risk in life and there's only hardly anything you can do to prevent it. Like oh. you could trip and break your neck tomorrow. Sure. No amount of government is going to stop that. No amount right. of regulations on where you can place bricks is going to stop that. <clears throat> sure. So the, the whole idea that you know, like I was explaining to you earlier off air, you know, people believe in this lie of false security um, and this, this, this false security that government supplies is utopian in, in idea that everyone is protected equally under the law. And that's an absolute farce because if you think you're as protected as Warren Buffett, you're an absolute moron. Sure, that's agreed. Also, I mean, how much power does, uh, say, um, Dave have to, um, you know, say, invade a, a, a country of millions of people and, uh, you know, bomb them? Uh, uh, how, many, how many resources can you come up with to um, create a, a, an atom bomb, you know, by yourself? So, um, I mean, if, if you did those things, only you could be accountable. You couldn't say, you know, we all voted to, for that. It was actually just Dave's choice. Uh, <laughs> exactly. So, I mean. Yeah. And just to build on something Eric mentioned uh, a moment ago uh, regarding, you know, the different ways that people are held accountable. And, and because I'm a capitalist and I like to interject this whenever I can. Evil. You're an evil man. I, well, I, guilty as charged and, uh, and self-proclaimed. Um, so the the accountability, you know, that, and this is something we hear all the time about, you know, getting one guy in to change things or what have you. Um, there is no contract. Mm -hmm. There is no contract. So there is no accountability. Mm. So if, you know, Dave, you know, Dave uh, 
has a has a has a Kickstarter campaign to invade Canada, and uh, he gathers together the resources through this Kickstarter campaign because taking all the maple syrup. Bloody Canucks, they're all too damn nice. You know, <coughs> they got to be up to something. I'm taking so, all the maple you know, syrup. Preemptive first strike. We got to do it. Right. Sure. So he gets this mm-hmm. Kickstarter campaign together. Cool. Well, he has contractual obligations, and if we substantially invest in this and maybe he puts out an IP and you know we all share stock in this venture you know because Canada's got oil sands baby Woo-hoo. Uh. Uh, you know he then also has a fiduciary responsibility to carry through with his contractual obligations and if he violates those we get to have his ass because whoever the party mediating this is they're going to be holding him personally responsible so you don't get any of that with the state what do they? What do the Republicans always say? This is a mandated uh, by vote or something. Uh, I can't remember the phrase, but you know, basically the whole idea is is that you're, when you say a libertarian is utopian, you really don't have a clue what utopian means. Number one, and number two, you have to realize that it's not utopian. To, like utopian means better for society. It's always a societal thing. This is all about the individual. Libertarianism is all about individual liberty, holding the individual above any collective. And uh, it's utopian can't, you could call it self-topian maybe. I, I, I really don't know what the word to use for it would be. But, I mean, libertarians literally just believe in non-aggression. That is 100% the entire platform. And... If you go with non-aggression, and you may be a person who believes that you are a non-aggressive person, but if you support government, you support aggression upon other individuals. The idea is, I want consent in my life. I want choices. I don't want to be forced into anything. And uh, that's pretty much it. Like, to call it utopian, to want no coercion in your life is kind of silly, (laughs) don't you think? Uh, Yeah, I mean... As far as that goes, I mean, isn't it just as utopian to believe that uh, just the right amount of force can perfect sure, society? I mean, isn't that what everybody wants? Is that uh, the the choice to do certain things? You know, some people believe that they uh, have a right to certain economic choices, and they will uh, believe that somehow government can create equality. Um, or you only know, the somehow, free market can create equality. Yeah, I mean, they, well, actually, they, equality they can't be that, achieved. Yeah, I mean, they believe that the government just can do anything. That that somehow, without government, there would be uh, no roads, no nine one one services. Uh, that you couldn't be protected from being invaded. That uh, I mean, it's really utopian to believe that that government is somehow God, that it can create things, uh, you know, out of thin, ha- thin air, uh, and that uh, no other solutions are possible. Lloyd, 45 seconds on the topic? Uh, uh, cl- closing remarks, whatever on that? Closing remarks. Um, the claims of your idea is utopian, uh, those typically come from someone who lacks self-knowledge. And that, you know, I mean, that's deplorable, but that's pretty much the milieu in which we're swimming as a society. So, you know, just treat people gently and let them, if you can, guide themselves to some level of self-knowledge. And, you know, questions like this address that. For sure. Good points. Okay, so our next objection, we'll go to Eric first. And this normally comes from... Dare I say it, Christians, uh, dare I say it, moral objectivists they, they, that believe that they get their objections or objectivism from God. Um, people are naturally evil and need to be controlled. Uh, yeah, I mean, I find this to be true for uh, pretty much anybody that believes in government. Um, so, yeah, a lot of... Uh, a lot of Christians and uh, um, pretty much, well, either you believe in God or you believe in government or you believe in both, it seems like, if you're a statist. So uh, if people are naturally evil and people 
are government, then it would also mean that government must be evil. Um, and do you want millions of people deciding who 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 are evil deciding what your sort of fate is and what you can do and make up the rules that that you uh, that you could probably choose on your own. Uh, I mean, it seems like <clears throat> if you are just dealing with yourself and other individuals that you could probably um, deal with the so-called evil. Um, but if you have an, an entire organization that is made up of, you know, 300 million people who decide one day that, uh, say, every, uh, you know, firstborn child in the country should be sacrificed to government, <laughs> uh, then you know, you can do nothing about it. Um, and so I think that if people are naturally evil, that um, it would be a lot easier to deal with those people on an individual basis than having to worry about what a majority might do to you. Very, very good, solid points. I, I contend that people who believe that there is an external authority outside of themselves are evil. They don't know it, they don't realize it, but they are evil. Because you are the ultimate authority in your life and you make the decisions for your life. There's, there's no one that can, that, that can, you know, like a robot, control you. Uh, you. You either believe that they have the authority to tell you what to do or, or you believe that you're the ultimate authority. So, Lloyd? Yeah, the uh, people are naturally evil and need to be controlled. Uh, therefore, the state is a self-detonating argument, actually. Um, <laughs> this all comes back, uh, I don't know if it goes back just to Hobbes, but uh, he's the one who really uh, made that argument, <clears throat> made it very well, actually, in uh, Leviathan. But uh, it's a self-detonating argument, because <laughs> if, if people are evil, and you want to create a social institution called government, who are you going to get to populate this? Well, obviously evil people, because people are evil, by definition, that you've already established. It's a logical contradiction. And then on top of it, you have the natural tendency of, well, what do evil people want? They want dominion over others. Okay, so then what you're doing is you're setting up a power vacuum that's going to suck towards it all the most evil people. Not just the crappy evil people, too. Not the petty burglars and, and strong-armed robbers. No, 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 no. Those guys suck. Most people with common sense can avoid them. You see that guy, you cross the street, you're away from him. You know, These, This power vacuum is going to attract the smartest, evilest, the Lex Luthers of the world. <laughs> Except for they'll wear an, Amar an Armani suit, and they'll have very bright white polished teeth and winning smiles, and they'll speak platitudes that, you know, assuage any of your emotional insecurities. They'll t tell you things that you want to hear. They'll, they'll offer you free stuff, which magically will come out of nowhere. <laughs> this is, of course, what the government is. It is simply a logical contradiction on, that preys upon people's fears and attracts the most evil and capable among us. Yeah, ra race cars are evil. Let's make one giant race car and, uh, and elect people to drive it. Who the fuck do you think is going to run for office on that? <laughs> yeah, not just one race car, but it's a race car the size of a coliseum. And it's going to plow through your whole neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous argument. Uh, it's circular, it's bad <clears throat> reasoning, and it's circular reasoning. I, I really like to take a... a, a I like to take a little bit from the Bible on this one, and, and it's, uh, you know, if you read the Bible, it says that the, that the devil, Satan, uh, comes to do three things, kill, steal, and destroy. If you look at uh, pretty much any uh, government ever, that's essentially their mo modus operandi. So, yeah, I'm calling government the devil. <laughs> I'm just... Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up the point about, uh, you, you know, the power vacuum. Um, because, I mean, that's why, you know, <clears throat> it's not just that power corrupts. It's that c 
corrupt people are just drawn to power. And I really appreciate that you brought that up because I was going to if you hadn't. <laughs> it's like the Lord of the Rings, the, the, the ring. You look at, you watch the movies, you read the books, everybody that tries to go after the ring and really needs and wants the ring, you see what happens when it's given to someone who doesn't want those aspirations, doesn't need those things. It tears the person apart. Right. And, that you know, that's, not to get off the subject, uh, I mean, this uh, harkens back to what we were talking about in the old right prior to the show. Uh, these were, you know, <clears throat> and uh, Tolkien and his uh, his uh, compatriot uh, C.S. Lewis, they were they were Christians, but they were also old right minarchists in that mm. respect. And sure. that was a parable, that whole story about the the lure, the temptation of uh, such power. And it really comes and it really comes down to that, you know, the it not only does that kind of power draw the worst among us but the worst part about it is because the state is built upon a, a moral hypocrisy that fundamental hypocrisy i have to rule you therefore i have two separate you know uh, moral principles you know by there are two separate moral uh, principles by which people live you know you can't do violence but i must do violence for you or mm. against you because oh, of that it not only attracts them but it protects them from from repercussions. Yeah, what it, is the old conservative platitude? You sleep sound and peacefully at night because there are men uh, willing to do yes. violence on your behalf. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Those are the guys I'm worrying about. Oh, and whether you want them to or not. Right. <laughs> that's that's never asked. That's the same. Yeah. Wait, how are those people that are doing violence funded? Huh. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Well, okay. that leads into one of our other. Questions, oh, that leads right? a lot to some Lysander's. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Milton Friedman. Look up his arguments about this. Uh, not not exactly every uh, anarchist's uh, favorite guy, especially those from the left. Like about ninety percent what he says. But yeah, uh, sound reasoning. The guy has sound reasoning. Where and I remember an interview uh, with Phil Donahue that he had, and God, mm -hmm. I just dated myself because I remembered this from. I, I think I've seen this. Kid. And so thankfully, it still lives on the internet. Uh, where are you going to get these angels? Yeah, yeah. they don't exist. Yeah, we're, you know, like uh, you look at, uh, look at anybody in big political office that has a substantial, you know, position. They're they're all freaking evil. They you can see it in their face. You can see <clears> the <throat> president, the ages like forty years by the time they're in office, and then when they get out. It's like someone injected them with a life shot. They pop back up and they look like a normal human. <laughs> Actually, oh. um, yeah. <laughs> like uh, you look at you look at George Bush. Go look at a six month timeline throughout his entire his entire presidency. Go look at every six months. It's insane. It goes from like healthy looking guy to the fucking crypt keeper and and all that evil and stress and really looking behind the curtain has to play toil on your mind. Um, but yeah, it just yeah. blows my mind what people think. You know, the, the circle meme that says people are evil so we need government ran by people are evil so we need government ran by people are evil. So, and it's just a circle. And it's just like don't people realize that you know, if if I went out tomorrow and I was a super scientist and I created some <clears throat> crazy device that could control all humans, who's going to be the first person to go after that? Obviously not Mr. Nice Guy. The worst of the among the smartest. Yeah, the, worst the worst among the smartest, correct. Yeah, I mean, Patrick Henry <laughs> uh, actually had a lot to say about, um, you know, people in power and uh he totally feared uh government and presidents and uh i mean i don't know what happened to him um, but <clears throat> he really really uh, uh spoke out uh against the constitution in the beginning he spoke out against standing armies and presidents I'm articulate. Uh, because of because of the danger of uh, of uh, of men being bad, and he said, "Show me that age and country where the rights and liberties of the people were placed on the sole chance of their rulers being good men, 
without co uh, consequent loss of liberty. So, I mean, even the founding fathers, at least they anti-federalists. Patrick Henry, Patrick Henry is probably my favorite um, founding fathers. Uh, so, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. He was basically laughed out of a lot of places, and then he got called an anarchist etc etc and this is a staunch Christian you're talking about when you're talking about Patrick Henry yes so all right we'll move to the next objection uh, it'll be uh, Lloyd up first and this is a uh, pretty crazy <laughs> okay go ahead and ask <laughs> cops slash troops protect your rights this one is my favorite because I'm an eight-year military veteran uh, what branch and, and uh, what branch and last uh, battalion or whatever were you in? I was in the Navy. Um, I, I, the, I enlisted in the year 2000 under Bill Clinton as the uh, POTUS commander in chief. Mm -hmm. And uh, within 90 days of me being deployed on my first deployment, which was to, uh, Operation Southern Watch, the Iraqi no-fly zone. Remember that from way back when? Uh, Not might really. be might be for junior high for some of the listeners. Um, yeah, uh, the coal got bombed while we were like ninety miles away, and so we feared chemical attacks, all kinds of things. And you know, and at no at no point in my enlistment or the point up to the coal getting bombed uh, was I thinking about Americans' freedoms, and none of that was talked about either. Uh, that is that was not part of the deal. That was part of the words that everyone mouthed at the enlistment ceremony when you took the oath, which is a, a grand oath in theory, but again, it's a piece of paper, and pieces of paper don't have agency. Only human beings do. And pieces of paper do not act. Human beings do. Therefore, pieces of paper are only as good as the people. Uh, and, as we've already established, people are not angels, so therefore, yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, after... Um, after the coal was bombed, um, uh, another year later, uh, September 11th happened, and just just about a year later, and so then I went on my next deployment, which was Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, we didn't launch the first bombs against the Taliban Freedom. in Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and of course, you know, this is how government sells everything. It always sells you that which it's going to take away by describing the antithesis, right? So if they had a, a war on poverty, let's just say, right? Let's they just do. imagine a crazy sales pitch. We're going to end poverty, right? So uh, what would they do? Well, <clears throat> they would take money from you. And so, of course, this gets rid of poverty, right? Of course not, because as we know, uh, anyone who's studied this at all, uh, poverty was on a 1% per annum decline from the end of World War II up until the great society programs were instituted. The government sells you that which it wants to take away. It, it's always pitching you, you know, the shoddy product that actually blows up in your face. It never selling you the real deal. They the Patriot have to Act. The Patriot Act, right? What is, now, prior to that, a good example, what was considered patriotic? You know, liberty, you know, these Amer American social institutions, which all have great value, you know, the family, you know, the church, which for all of its faults has a lot of positives to it. All these things, right? These were American as apple pie, you know. That's what it meant to be a patriot. Fight for, the, for right and the weak and the oppressed and all, the, all these really high-minded sounded good things. And so what did they sell it as? This thing that took away your liberties, that spied on, you know, spied on you that violated your rights, that you know, undermined those social institutions that you prize. This is what they always do. So, uh, but yeah, anyway, so I, we did an Operation Enduring Freedom, and uh, that was kind of boring, and then at the end of about six months of doing that and dropping bombs on, on uh, Afghanistan, we um, decided to invade Iraq. I say we in the hilarious uh, royal sense because uh, no, nobody I know wanted to do that. We all 2004? wanted to come home. Uh, 2002 if I remember correctly. And so, oh, three. 
Well, my wife's over here. She was with me. We were in the uh, we were in the Navy together. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I thought uh, it was like late 2003. I couldn't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, so we do Iraqi freedom, and after almost a year out at sea, away from our loved ones, and you know, in the Persian Gulf and whatnot, we come home and. I had a third deployment and some time as a military recruiter too, but those are a whole nother ball of wax. But suffice it to say, at no point, at no point whatsoever, were, was the defense of the homeland what was pitched. And I remember even when George Bush flew onto the, flew onto the tarmac of our, of our carrier and gave his mission accomplished speech, yeah, I was in the crowd of faces out there, and my wife was standing behind him. Uh, yeah, mission accomplished. I mean, yeah, mission accomplished. And, you know, granted, that's used rhetorically by the, by, you know, sophists to, you know, say, equate that we were done with all military operations. No, we were just done with, you know, our mission. The Abraham Lincoln's mission was accomplished. We did our thing. We came home. Uh, but, you know, it's much more, it's much more enjoyable to paint it in broader strokes. But, uh it, 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 the whole thing is ridiculous. I, we don't do this for anything other than our own self-interest when we enlist. Uh, I enlisted about 70 people into the Navy when I was a military recruiter. Uh, one, one of those joined because he felt an honest and earnest uh, commitment to defend the United States. Uh, and he ended up becoming a SEAL. All the rest won pussy and college money generally in that order well and fair. i said gentlemen <laughs> if that's what you're here for then your wish will be granted by your experiences if you're here to do this that and the other well you might want to do some more soul searching because you might be disappointed <laughs> for sure i uh i always find it funny that cops people claim that cops protect our freedoms our rights whatever and you know they in in academy they teach co cops to lie to you to trick you into giving up your rights voluntarily uh so they can increase their you know their protection racket and their their ticketing and uh, revenue collection and it's like if they were truly out there to protect your rights they would go out of business i mean i'm being dead serious here like if every cop pulled you over and goes hey look and all your constitutional rights uh, I'm not going to bother you. You just need to slow down and turn around and walk away. They go out of business. Sure. Uh, well, I uh, mean, and the very the very idea is ridiculous. Uh, they're not there to protect your rights. It can't be. They exist by virtue of the fact that your property rights are being violated. For sure. I yeah. I, I, I earned forty five thousand dollars a year when my last couple of years as a as a sailor, not counting the benefits, which accrued to about eighty thousand total. But so, you pay taxes, man. Come yeah, on. I pay taxes out of my salary. How ridiculous is that, right? Anyway, uh, so I, I stole from you guys, and I got stolen from a little bit, too. It's like they did a little skimming off no, the No, no, they don't, so they don't steal like from government employees. A government employee doesn't get stolen from. They get paid an artificially market demand to the market demand price for their labor. And then some of that is taken back by government to boondoggle and some other uh, sure, sure. program. Yep. So like like a job on the free market would be get paid twenty thousand or let's just do simple math ten thousand dollars a year. Well, the the government job would be eighteen thousand dollars a year, and then you would get taxed back down to ten thousand. But you're making eighteen thousand, so it's a uh, it's just a boondoggle. That's all it is. It's a lie. But yeah, it's it's again it's a it's a it's a obvious logical contradiction because you cannot simultaneously do something and be fighting against it and that is exactly what we are uh, we are professed to do so we protect your rights but we exist by virtue of violating your rights well that at least no you were in the sense. branch of government that is actually appropriated by the constitution sure sure yeah. thank yeah. thank the lord yeah. you were actually in one that was supposed to be there <laughs> that 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 minor concession uh, i'll grant yeah <laughs> I love it when I talk to uh, constitutionalist uh, milita uh, marine or not Marines because that's part of the Navy, but Air Force, uh, Army, wherever the hell else. You know, I always love it when I talk to them, and then I go, "Wait, you do realize that a stand standing army is prohibited by the Constitution, right?" And they're like, "What? What? What? Uh, uh, what?" <laughs> so it just, uh, Eric, anything you want to say on this this subject? <clears throat> 
Yeah, um, so, I mean, which rights actually do they protect? Uh, soldiers, police, I mean, uh, I noticed that there's a lot of organizations. Your rights, yeah, Eric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your rights. They just It's one big thing. Your rights. They protect those. Duh. Right. <laughs> Uh, as far as I can tell, really, the Constitution, as far as rights go, doesn't really grant a lot for property. Uh, so it's kind of subjective as far as rights go. I mean, they do and they don't. And they still provide that your property can be taken as long as the government is correct in its assumption about which law you broke or whatever. Um, but at the same time... Uh, you know, they don't even protect those rights. Uh, I, you know, we have the Patriot Act. We have the National um, Defense Authorization Act. We have uh, all of these laws with uh, regard to, um, you know, what kind of guns you can own or how to get guns, uh, you know, where you can fish and how much you have to pay to fish there for a certain amount of time during a season, hunting laws. Uh, laws on, um, you know, as far as uh, just national parks in general, uh, state parks, um, states' rights. I don't even know what those are. Um, not sure how a state can have rights, but really they don't protect any uh, individual rights. And, um, you know, any time, I mean, we see where, I mean, you, you can't drive without you know, a, a permission slip. You can't really do much without a government permission slip. You have to have insurance. You're, you're, you, I mean, in no sense of any sort of uh, uh, meaning does anybody actually have any rights that the state cannot take away with um, impunity or, or legally. And so uh, saying that they protect, they might be able to, uh, enforce certain laws, uh, but that doesn't really equate to protecting rights. No, yeah, you're right. And uh, I tell people all the time, you know, like 90% uh, of government, no, nah, more than that, probably 98% of all government uh, organizations are unconstitutional. <laughs> so what, what are all these army and, and cops, what are they actually doing to arrest politicians that are uh, falsely putting up a... Uh, functions of the government that aren't appropriated by the Constitution. Like, they're doing nothing because they benefit from it. So... And also, I mean, I also am not positive, but I'm pretty sure that city police are not uh, even constitutional. They they are. Um, um, they, they are, because it's the city making the police. The, the cops just can't overstep your constitutional uh, rights, mm -hmm. so to say. So they can do pretty much whatever. They just can't overstep that. Now, the sheriff's department, that is constitutional. Sure. Sheriffs, uh, sheriffs and Navy are the... Uh, sheriffs, Navy, and Postal Office are pretty much the only three things that exist. And even them, they're wholly inefficient. Uh -huh. um, well, at least, at least we have the right to vote. <laughs> the vote the vote is a lie. You know, like I was telling you guys... All right, maybe we, I said it earlier, you know, if you think your vote matters as much as, as David Rockefeller or Warren Buffett, you're an absolute idiot. Let's move on to the other question, which is kind of the same thing, um, or not question, objection, and it's, uh, without soldiers, you have no rights. And that's kind of the same question, but it's not that they're protecting your rights. It's that if there was sans <clears throat> soldiers, you would have no rights, which is really ridiculous. And Eric's got the first one on this one um yeah i mean i guess without if without the the existence of a uh military that i probably wouldn't have the ability to um take air into my lungs or you know walk or think or... you had me scared for a second <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what? I mean, what exactly does that even mean? Without soldiers, you have no rights. I mean, with soldiers, I have no rights. I have no rights to my property. I have no right to uh, say, uh, you know, desecrate a 
certain piece of fabric with color on it. Uh, you know, it just depends on how close I am to them. You know, if I if I do some sort of uh, thing to my own property in front of them, then uh, you know, I don't know. I guess I guess I don't have that right anymore. Um, I only have rights, I guess. When Gosh, I'm missing the money train. So I mean, I'm missing the know. money train. I need to make a YouTube video of like a guy, you know, an army, army soldier dressed up, and it's, you know, it's some chick dancing on the flag or whatever, and it and it pans over, kind of like the Indian with the pollution. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's the and it's just the the the, the soldier sitting there with his his tear. Like, My brother's died for that flag, dude. <laughs> I hate that sentiment that a soldier dies for a flag. That's yeah, the most. That, in that doesn't even uh, match up with what's real out there. I mean, <laughs> you get you get actual. If they were you volunteering, get, you get people out there and who receiving no do pay, die for shit, but it is never for the flag. It's for the guy in the trench next to them, and that's the typical bond of empathy that you develop when you're in service with another person and. You know, being shoved into harm's way by assholes who will have you shot if you don't. Uh, you develop that bond of empathy and brotherhood. And that's why you get jarheads or so, I mean, especially the jarheads because they're so intensely trained. You know, it's not that they're patriotic and love their country. That's the propaganda they buy. What they really love is their fellow man in the fucking trenches with them because sure, and they, they become like to brothers. Associate it that because that's yeah, exactly, exactly how the government uh, wins them over. Yeah, um, it's a form of brainwashing when you have your friend right next to you and you're fighting for him and they call that uh, you know fighting for their flag or their government or their country. Exactly. Not necessarily their government but their country but I mean they're just so duped and I mean and that doesn't mean that they're not culpable to a degree. I mean those who are, are defending themselves against them are uh, no less, uh, I would say, uh, immoral than they are for the defending their lives. Uh, not that, not that uh, all of the people that we are over there fighting are good, but you know, it, it doesn't mean that they're all bad either. And so, I mean, <clears throat> besides that, you know, I mean, I don't know which how a soldier can give you a right if they're not uh, here you know, protecting your rights. A man cannot give another man a right. Indeed. That's, 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 that is literally what you're saying when you say soldiers give us our rights or protect our rights or do anything. Uh, you Only you can protect your rights. A soldier can protect his own rights. I'll give him that. I'll, I will agree with that sentiment. But you, soldiers do not protect our rights. They, they protect the government extortion racket. That's that's literally all they do, the expanding of it or the defense of it. That is it. Right. So uh, really, it comes down to a faulty premise. Uh, so the the premise, and I don't even like the the term rights because I find it uh, sure. not a particularly useful one. Agreed. Uh, simply due to uh, you know vernacular usage and mangling of the term. I mean, good lord, a right to a job? What are you effing kidding me? Uh, the positive yeah, rights, those, negative those, rights, all those, these um, things. They, they really require a lot of in-depth knowledge about philosophy and uh, political science. And, but really, they, they, <laughs> the false premise, even if you accept the concept of rights instead of you know, using principles as a philosopher would, um, is, y yeah, they're not granted by anyone. They're innate. They're inalienable. Read the damn Constitution. If you're, if you're into this and you want to uh, recognize uh, some, some at least valid arguments regarding uh, these things called rights, uh, read the Constitution. They're actually pretty damn well defined in there. Uh, you know, you, ha you have these things that are a part of your nature as an independent moral agent who is conscious, sentient, and, you know, sapient. <laughs> these things are called rights. Uh, they are not well defined because they're, uh, a lot of them are kind of situational, uh, but you know, the, the, certainly no social organization of other human beings just like yourself has the ability to magically grant you something that is a conceptual abstraction. It's just not, it's not valid. Uh, and so my right to live, my right to life, exists only so long as I'm willing to exercise and defend it. 
And these Correct. Are, these are things that you can see in nature. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's that's a slam dunk swish right there. I, I really have not much else to add on this whole cops, soldiers, protect our rights, or without soldiers we would have no rights. That's when someone says that they normally are at a point where they're 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 not thinking logically. They're not thinking. Um, you can condu- stop right there. They're just not thinking. Well, I was going to say conducive to <laughs> rational thought. It's like they, they just want you to shut up and go away when they say that. Sure. It's the feels yeah. train. Yeah, it's the feels. Like, my feels matter. <laughs> all, all feels matter. No, no. It's, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, Love those yeah. memes. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, uh, oh, God. These soldiers, they die for us. No, they, like, you have to realize what they're actually dying and fighting for. They're not. They're not dying for your freedom. They're not dying to keep make sure that the Constitution that is violating your humanity exists. They're they're dying and fighting and training and being welfare recipients to prop up a government extortion racket. That is literally all they're doing. Yeah, and I mean that's the empirical. Hey, what is it that you have accomplished? You know. Oh, I have sustained the uh, agency known as the government. What, it, what are you actually in it for? What is their motivation? That is myriad. But mostly, just based on uh, uh, recruiting studies that have been done, mostly it's college money because the price of college has been inflated. And otherwise, pussy. Pussy is a Welfare. big motivator. Don't Welfare. That, that. Like the pussy, okay, that's, <laughs> that's because there's welfare whores out there that love welfare recipients, I guess. But, uh, you know, if you're going into the military to bomb and kill people for college money you're a welfare recipient the people mm-hmm. that you're looking at when you drive through the hood or a bad area and they're sitting on their porch all day collecting a check you're no better than that person agreed well actually that person's better than you because they're not willing to kill for that check so yep all right we'll move to our last one then we'll wrap up um how do we stop groups like <coughs> ISIS? And we can put a parenthesis beside ISIS and say terrorist groups. Um, I would make the assertion, first off, that point to a terrorist group like ISIS that hasn't been funded by a government. So obviously if we wanted to stop ISIS, we would get rid of government. But <coughs> Lloyd, uh, if you want to go on this topic... Uh... Sure. So... Um... <laughs> Uh, I'm a, I'm a parent, so a lot of, a lot of what I've gone in, a lot of what I've tried to apply in my parenting, and uh, my wife is with me on this one, is prevention rather than cure. So the surest way to not get in a fight at the bar when you sidle up to the bar and you order yourself a couple drinks, the best way you can guarantee that you're not going to get in a fight that night is to not punch the guy in the face next to you. So you do you don't do that and you're probably you know you're definitely increasing your odds of walking out of the bar without a fight like a great deal, right? I think we can all agree upon that. I mean that. there's some times mm-hmm. where some asshole just walks up and hits you. I mean it's happened to me. Sure. sure. But I mean those are rarities, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, prevention rather than cure. First off, right? so if one out of every hundred times you you walk into a bar, you get punched into in, in the face, you're going to go, wow, what a, what a lousy day, right? What can I do to maybe take a look at that in the future? Maybe isolate that guy, f- track him down, whatever you need to do, right? Mm. Um, or, you know, simply exclude him, uh, divest him from your community, blacklist him. Blacklisting socially and uh, economically is a really, really effective means of... Uh, removing people's bad behaviors Uh, you know everything that you don't like in society right now you can almost bet your ass that the government is subsidizing it one way shape or form Um, but simply when it comes to you know rogue groups like this with violent agendas you take a little bit of prevention instead we never had any of these problems in America you know from the Middle East prior to us overthrowing you know, the, pre- the duly elected president of, of Iran. Well, we did that. We installed the Shah for 20-something years. We, well, we installed, the economic process, we installed the Saddam Hussein as well. Yeah, exactly. This is, I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And that followed 
shortly after the, the Shah of Iran. And the Mahajadeen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the Shah the of Indians. Iran. Yeah, exactly. So prevention uh, yes. rather than cure. <laughs> you don't do these things, and you don't have a bunch of, you know, 1.6 million, or sorry, billion Muslims kind of pissed at you. You don't, in, you know, institute economic sanctions and strangle a country in a region for 20 years. Thank you, Bill Clinton and the Bushes. And, you know, mm -hmm. maybe a couple million children don't die and Madeleine Albright doesn't go, eh, it was worth it. Maybe if you're not the callous cunts of the world, you know, maybe 1.6 billion people don't look at you like the great Satan. Maybe if you don't do all those things, maybe, just maybe, they just don't give a damn about you. So, you know, and if you're that guy walking into the bar, you know, okay, you don't walk up and punch the dude in the face. Maybe the guy doesn't want to punch you back. And no, no, I 100% I, I agree. But the other big point I'd like to make, and maybe Eric can expound upon this, is there's absolutely no way logistically outside of terrorist cells, um, them moving here and attacking. And as long as they attack the government, I really don't care. Um them coming here and getting here in any kind of full force that couldn't even be shut down by a bunch of rednecks with rifles um, is absolutely ludicrous. Like, there's no terrorist cell that could blatantly attack America and not get shut down by its own, by <coughs> the own, like, civilians could stop it. There's no reason to have a multi trillion dollar boondoggle of socialist military trying to fight this problem when the NSA just came out the other day and said that they've stop zero terrorist attacks mm. right so you're now you're talking more of a like an approach to dealing with an, an existing issue so uh, no of not course i'm trying to square peg a round hole but right right I, Wait, it, no, no, it, I, that, I mean that's totally legitimate that's totally legitimate i mean you have prevention rather than cure but you know we've made this mess right say t tomorrow america was a stateless society How and i'm not saying every up? civilian in america is innocent there are a lot of people in america that want Every Muslim off this earth, they want them killed sure. tomorrow. If they could snap their fingers and every Muslim disappeared off the face of the earth, they couldn't be more happier. So I'm not saying that everyone's innocent on this. Sure. But what I'm saying is, is the idea of a flagged nation, number one, a flagged nation attacking this geographical region is asinine and ridiculous mm -hmm. to even consider that. It will be right. total annihilation for whoever did that. And number two, you're not going to stop any amount of terrorism because most of the time, large terrorist groups are funded by governments. Right. Right. So like I was saying, it's, you know, it, prevention is one aspect, right? And then you have the addressing, you know, the actual problems. Well, it, it's time to take a look at the actual scale of the problem. Well, how many people were you talking about? Okay. And like you point out the logistics. Okay. So what, well, well, what do terrorists do? They're not seeking to conquer a country. That's not what terrorists do. That's not their aim. That's never their goal. Well, their, their goal is to their attempt to is affect political change through violence and fear. That's the definition of terrorism, which we do by definition, which is why they never want to set laws defining terrorism because we would be complicit. Eric. So, yeah, I mean, I just don't feel like ISIS would exist without the United States government, not just because of what we've done to um, create uh, unpopularity or, uh, of the United States, but also just because uh, we armed the Free Syrian Army. We armed we? the... Li I'm sorry? We? Yeah. yeah. Well, the U.S. government armed the... Th thank you armed the uh, I've never armed one Islamic sure, terrorist sure. ever we as in yeah so uh the government created uh, some some terrorists basically through to de to destabilize you know the regions you know whenever these leaders move away from the petrodollar of the United States the United States has to uh intervene um you know they would never try to insert anyone into a country's leadership that actually did a good job because if they decided not to do something that the United States wanted them to do then uh, they would be hard to to uh, take out 
You know, it's easy to take out a dictator because nobody likes them, but it's really hard to take away somebody who actually cares about their country. Um, but as far as ISIS goes, I'm totally right. They started out at like 30,000 or maybe even less than that. And what are they going to do against a country with uh, 40 million gun owners? Um, who, you know, who would just destroy them? I mean, it's way bigger than 40 million. Yeah, I mean, I'm just I think it's I'm 100 just, I mean, million. like in one one state probably. But um the point is that, you know, they they would never stand a chance. Uh if we went to war to for uh, uh with two countries uh with millions of people over what nine terrorists did on uh on 9/11, then you know, maybe our priorities are just a little jacked up. How many children had to die? you know, for those nine people. Uh, and um, But as far as ISIS goes, I mean, dealing with ISIS in a free society, ISIS would not exist. And if ISIS did exist, they wouldn't last long um, because they wouldn't have any sort of power structure to take over to begin with. I mean, That's there's, there's Americans volunteering to go over there Sure. And live with the Kurds and fight back ISIS. Like that's, right. I mean... And they're doing that for free. I mean, power like that requires something to take. Like, you cannot take over an anarchist society because there is no centralized leadership. There is no government to take over. There is no, uh, no power structure. And so the only way that ISIS can exist is, I mean, well, how do, what does it do to gain, gain power? Well, not only does it take over towns, but it also takes over um, bases that have guns and weapons that already exist for them to have. Like, they would not be able to get this uh, sort of uh, armory and, and, and guns and things like that if they did not already sort of put them out for them to take. Um, so, yeah, I just don't think they would last in a free society or even exist. I always laugh and like to think about people that are blind nationalists or flag wavers or whatnot. And I, I always would love to sit down and ask them all one question. It's like, do you think that the military industrial complex, and if they don't understand what that is, I can explain it. If you don't know what it is, Google it. Um, do you think they were happy about 9-11 or sad? And there's no way you couldn't say happy because their profits went out of the, through the roof after it. So, <laughs> if you don't think the if you don't think the game is rigged, if you don't think 9/11 or any kind of false flag is is typically allowed to happen, and innocents are allowed to be killed uh, for profit to continuate war, you're slightly confused. So, if you want next time you want to think a troop. Thank a soldier or whatnot for protecting your freedom. Remove the word freedom and say thank you for protecting Boeing and Lockheed Martin and any firearms creator or whatnot that poppy has government. Farms. Poppy farms. Yeah. <laughs> think the think think them for protecting that. You know. Thank you. Thank them for protecting Senator Shelby Graham's pocketbooks. Thank. Tell, tell them to thank uh, Jeb Bush and George Bush's wallets and Bill Clinton's wallets. But uh, yeah, any, any closing remarks you guys want to throw out? Wrapping it up, anything, anything you want to plug or say to the millions and millions that'll see this at home? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, basically, I think that a lot of the problems and uh, that the the fears that people have are enhanced by government, whether it is a uh, uh, utopianism uh, people are evil uh, you know what are they going to do if they have no cops or troops to protect their so called rights uh, what are you going to do about rogue organizations like ISIS all of that stuff to me really seems to be exacerbated and increased when governments exist and that the best way to sort of defeat that kind of uh, enemy at least for the most part, is in a society that it has a lot more accountability 
in, in, in a uh, in sort of a where individuals have to make their own decisions and that uh, nobody is responsible for someone else necessarily uh, where you're responsible for yourself and your own decisions um, and you you know you don't have to worry so much about um, what your neighbor does and you just worry about what you do and if you want to do something then you can be proactive instead of forcing everyone else to sort of live by your moral preferences. For sure. Lloyd? <laughs> yeah, um, I would, mine is rather simple. Um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So we have a, a unique geographic opportunity uh, as a country with massive resources, uh, a legacy of 200 years of very successful entrepreneurial uh, economic activity. And uh, yeah, an ocean on either side of us and friendly neighbors to the north and to the south to be free, to be really free. And you know, it would be a real shame if we can't accomplish that. You know, ne definitely not within our lifetimes. I just don't see that practically happening. But you know, in the not too distant future, it would be a really sh it'd be a real shame if uh, we squandered this opportunity and chose instead the, uh, the the bad path of going the same route as the British Empire before us, and whose you know lead we kind of picked up on. And uh, you know, in addition to an ounce of prevention being worth a, a pound of cure, don't look to other people to solve your problems. Lead yourself. Be your own master. You really don't need the chains. Yeah, well said, Lloyd. Uh, really want everyone to. Th I really want to thank everyone to watch uh, for watching this show. You can check out any and all of our other content at theseedsofliberty.com here on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at Seeds of Liberty. Check us out on Facebook at uh, facebookcom podcast. This is Dave signing off. I really appreciate you watching. Thanks, guys. Thanks.